also Technicorum Holdings, serial entrepreneur, founder of Gravitas International, founder of Crypt Technologies, chief strategies advisor, Technicorum, strategic advisor of KingSwap, Dex, presently building an ecosystem center around the blockchain technology. He offers advisory, tech, fintech challenges, new banks, DeFi identify, waste tech, super apps, focus on DeFi projects. He is author of two books, How to ICO, ITO in Singapore, DeFi. Over to you, Makam. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rajan, for your introduction. <clears throat> Great to be here again. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a regular speaker at your sessions. Uh, always good to have all the very topical uh, subjects to speak about and seeing a great lineup of uh, speakers uh, that you always bring to the table as well. Uh, thanks very much, Rajan. So great to speak with all of you. Uh, I come from Singapore. Um, uh, due to the COVID situation, I haven't been able to fly very much, but here we are uh, through the webinar. So the topic that I'll be speaking about right now, like uh, Rajan mentioned, is on DAO. Uh, DAO means Decentralized Autonomous Organization, uh, in case uh, any of you are not familiar with the acronym. <clears throat> and secondly, governance. And thirdly, the future of DeFi. Now, um, Rajan kindly introduced that I've written two books. So in my first book in, that was published in October 2017 on how to ICO, um, that, was, that had a section on the predictions. And I'm happy to say that uh, pretty much everything that I predicted in that chapter came about. Uh, over the next three and a half years uh, to today. And the second book, which I've written, it was published in September 2020. Uh, that was on decentralized finance, DeFi. <clears throat> and uh, we are still seeing that play out, but it's a tremendous, it's been a tremendous ride. When I was, when I wrote this book and published it, I think the total value locked was something like um, nine, or, nine or $10 billion. Uh, today, uh, even despite a big market correction, I'm seeing on DeFi Pulse, the numbers being shown are $40 billion uh, total value locked in the DeFi space. On CoinGecko, they say that the whole ecosystem is $80 billion. Uh, earlier, Rajan prepared some slides and showed $20 billion. So you, you can see how fast-paced the, the industry is. Every week is moving. Uh, Bitcoin, the last one, two weeks, it was going up like $1,000 every day. So uh, investors uh, and people who were asking me about whether to get into these things, they, every day they were asking, will it drop, will it drop, will it drop? <laughs> so every, it, it just keeps going up. Um, but like I said, last uh, yesterday and today, there was a major correction. Uh, but anyway, I, I think it's a new normal, right? With more and more uh, financial institutions, uh, institutional investors getting in the space, uh, we are seeing a, a totally new market cap. Uh, the, total value, the total value of cryptocurrencies is about 1.5 trillion right now. Uh, for the longest time, it was way below uh, the 830 billion that started in January 2018. And since we are on the, the topic of DeFi, DeFi uh, basically started sometime in August 2017. And uh, at that time, it was zero, zero value locked in the three and a half years ago. And today it's uh, over 40 billion. And that shows the tremendous growth and it's an exponential curve. Anyone looking at the curve can see this is an exponential curve up. And that's what's getting everybody so excited. Uh, now with the, the world dealing with the digital technologies, with the COVID situation, uh, more and more people are turning online and online convenience is paramount. Right. Uh, no longer are you bound to having financial investments uh, through the traditional methods. Uh, now you can, if you are savvy enough, you can access decentralized finance and you can basically generate your own yield and at much higher percentages than before. So let's get back to the first topic, uh, first topic of, of DAOs. The most famous DAO was, of course, the, the case that made the Howey test. Right, so there was this, uh, these, there was a decentralized autonomous organization uh, that started basically around 2016, 2017. It raised a tremendous amount of money. Uh, I think something like over a hundred million dollars. And then there was an attack. Uh, some hackers found a vulnerability and created something called a child DAO. So uh, basically, a baby decentralized autonomous organization. And uh, Unprecedented, uh, the Ethereum Foundation stepped in and segregated the chains and basically reversed the transaction to uh, help the situation. And out of this, uh, due to the, the spotlight that was that was uh, shone on this um, 
failed venture. That DAO was basically to raise money from investors, retail investors all over the world in order to invest in venture capital companies. And of course, those of you who are very familiar with ICOs, you all know that ICOs are a major disruption of the VC market. So venture capitalists from the last 10, 15 years of, v, of VC funding have been disrupted in the last few years through the, the phenomenon called initial coin offerings. So this DAO was to raise money to invest in interesting, innovative projects. And unfortunately, they were subject to a hack. So that uh, cast a huge uh, spotlight and, and cast basically cryptocurrencies in a bad light. The US SEC sued. Uh, the office of US SEC took up a case against the, the few names that they could find that were connected to the DAO project and they sued and the uh, uh, courts ruled that the Howey test was applicable and that was uh, basically the start of the downslide of the American ICO scene. Uh, so basically it started getting very regulated up. So where does that leave us today? Today we are seeing more and more decentralized finance projects coming up. Um, these are semi-anonymous or fully anonymous. Uh, in fact, many of these developers, uh, we don't even know who they are. Uh, I was asked to be an advisor to a, a few projects and a, a few of them use Discord as their uh, choice of channel. <clears throat> so it, it's, a, it's a typical journey. You go to a Discord channel, you talk to a few developers there who are totally anonymous. And they don't even give you any names, no KYC, no nothing. And then they say, oh, they have this idea. They have been cooking this for the last three to six months and they're going to launch it soon. And then they will build up some community support. And this is totally decentralized. You don't even know who's the founder, don't know who are the team. If something goes wrong, blows up, you have no idea who you're going after. That's the, the negative side of the DAO. The positive side of the DAO is that this unlocks creativity. It allows people to innovate. And um, you can see so many new technology, technological improvements and financial products create, being created out of these peer-to-peer uh, -peer kinds of environment. <clears throat> So what, what are DAOs basically in our legal and uh, regulatory kind of environment today? Um, basically, these are organizations without any known leaders, uh, which makes it very difficult to govern and very difficult to police. So this, there are positive effects, there are negative effects. Uh, my personal view is that DAOs have a certain place in the, in the world if they can achieve critical mass and they can achieve uh, public recognition fast enough, uh, then they won't be shut down. Then pretty much just like you see Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, pretty much every government around the world is now accepting them as uh, some kind of value. Some governments treat them as payments, like e-money, electronic money or digital money. Some governments treat them as commodities. Some uh, unfortunately still ban them, but uh, it's not really strictly enforced. And uh, some governments with, which are experiencing hyperinflation uh, definitely anti uh, cryptocurrencies because that's a viable alternative to their traditional fiat currencies, which are getting developed, right? So the organizations such as Ethereum, Bitcoin Foundation, uh, that sprang out of uh, the works of a few developers, <clears throat> and in the case of Bitcoin, uh, the anonymous Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, were the first uh, instances that we see today of uh, such DAOs, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. Basically, no governing body is self-governed. The developers um, meet, discuss how the code should go if uh, any upgrades are being done. And out of that uh, collaborative environment, Ethereum community is the largest developer community in the world. And they have strong community support. And recently, they have moved on to a proof of stake uh, algorithm. And now, over the next one and a half to two years, the proof of stake uh, uh, improvement will will happen, right? So this is the effort of a large organization of developers who simply come together and. and So this is very different from a traditional corporation uh, where it's uh, profit driven. Uh, the motive in any corporation is to make money, right? It's not to do, uh, not to roll out certain products or services. 
essentially entrepreneurs are there to make money. The fastest, easiest way to make money is probably the best, right? Those who are, of course, doing certain co companies, uh, creating certain businesses for passion, that's a different story. But invariably, most entrepreneurs are uh, driven by the profit motive. <clears throat> so it's a very different motive from an organization that is decentralized. For a decentralized organization, it could be passion, it could be uh, community belief, uh, it could be altruistic uh, views, <clears throat> but it is very different from a corporation driven by a CEO whose profit motive uh, overrides everything else. Right. So this is a very interesting uh, dichotomy between the new uh, de decentralized autonomous organizations, uh, which basically exist on the cloud or anonymously uh, somewhere on the internet, and it's very, very difficult to nail down. And of course, the traditional regulated companies where you know you have corporate service providers in every country who will register the company, uh, issue you the shares, uh, issue you the share certificates, and then register you with the registrar of companies and businesses in every country. So very interesting. Uh, I think I personally think that DAO has a place in our uh, ecosystem. It's already being seen. Uh, more and more of such projects are coming up. Uh, unfortunately, of course, uh, I would say 80-20 rule exists as well. 80% of these profit of these um, organizations are not really to incentivize the community, but is to incentivize the founders or the guys who came up with the idea. But there would be, a, I would say, in the in the system right now, there are a few projects that I have actually come across personally and uh, doing good. Uh, they are trying to use the funding from the community to grow their their spheres, influence, um, promote their projects, promote their protocols, right? Um, I've a, a few years ago, NEM was very popular. Unfortunately, the foundation ran into some difficulties uh, with, with the former founder and with uh, some funds being uh, frittered away. Um, I, I know of Dash. Dash is actually a very good example of a well-run foundation uh, that you know has a certain funding that's voted on by the community. Um, Ethereum, of course, is a great example. The community is bending together all the time to roll out the improvements. Um, and Ethereum, of course, is super highly sought after right now, very, very much in use. Uh, Ethereum gas fees have gone up crazy amounts like 10 times to 100 times 200 times even on certain days uh, and and that's why at some of our projects we have implemented layer two technologies to reduce the gas fees otherwise it's simply uh, almost impossible to utilize because the fee structures are so high but uh, these are certain advantages of having DAOs and I think regulators around the world will have an interesting uh, few years to try to catch up with all these organizations and basically how to govern them. Because there are certain issues with every uh, legal system in terms of governance of the incorporation of companies and uh, creation of businesses uh, that simply can't really exist in the current environment of legal system uh, with such decentralized organizations. So the regulators are making do and that's something very interesting to observe moving forward. But in the meantime, more and more projects are going to use this kind of a model um, and say it's for the community, it's governed for the community, it's for the common good. And that brings me to the next, uh, nicely to the next category of uh, what we are talking about, which is governance. Now, governance uh, can be in a traditional method, which is basically the board of the, uh, the advisory board, or supervisory board overseeing the directors of the companies and the key officers of the company, uh, such as the CEO, the COO, the CTO, etc., um, or managing director, uh, general manager, depending on which country, depending on what job titles they are, VP sales, you know, uh, VP business development, etc. So these are all the titled uh, management of companies, and that's how they govern. They basically uh, run the projects run the companies. Now, governance structures in decentralized finance is very, very different. Uh, governance structures in decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs, are very, very different. In such organizations, uh, there would usually be a governance token. Uh, so more often than not, the native tokens will be considered a governance token. One of the most popular in the market right now is the BNB token, uh, Binance. Binance actually did a ICO back in, I think, September 2017, and they raised like $15 million. Uh, today, I, I don't know, I can't even remember how many billions they are already. <laughs> so they, are, they have grown from strength to strength. <clears throat> BNB was one of the first uh, tokens that had a governance model, meaning that people who had the native tokens could vote on which project could be listed next. 
So uh, Huopi, uh, HT, the Huopi token, also use the same governance model. And both of these companies uh, utilize these governance models to great effect, meaning that they made it mandatory for new projects to acquire votes. So either they had to buy these tokens in order to vote themselves in, or they had to go and lobby for support and basically buy votes. So this, this is very interesting, right? So it's a centralized method of uh, vote buying uh, that has been happening over the last three years. Uh, so governance tokens could be used to vote for certain actions. Uh, governance tokens in certain cases can also be utilized. Um, and how, how, do, how does this work? Basically, all you have to do is to show that you have a smart, uh, the, the, the wallet that has the, uh, your wallet address has the particular tokens. And then from the smart contract that they would have on their platforms, uh, they would then accord you a certain number of votes or certain voting rights. And then you can vote on a variety of issues. So usually these will be something like a Google form, certain questions or a survey. And then there will be a certain question that's posed by the management committee. And then the uh, people with the ability to vote will vote on the issues that are at hand. Um, so this something interesting um, like this happened for the Sushi Swap project that happened around October, uh, August to September last year. <clears throat> and the governance tokens were then uh, instituted later after Chef Nomi, which is the original founder of uh, Sushi Swap, uh, ran off with uh, the entire development uh, pool of 10% 10, 10 of the tokens. It, later, he came back, he apologized to the community, ashamed, and then returned the money. And then the, uh, a big uh, market maker and trading group took over uh, some, some guy who was also a main uh, driver behind Uniswap. And uh, after this uh, takeover, then Chef Nomi was given a parting gift, which basically equated to the, the value of the tokens that he, he ran off with in the first place. Uh, so it's quite a funny story. But anyway, what I wanted to drive at is that a governance was then uh, instituted. So uh, Sushi Swap then had a governance model where the votes uh, could be used to decide on the next direction of the project. Uniswap, of course, uh, is a huge name as well in the decentralized finance and uh, decentralized exchange uh, arena. And Uniswap uh, is, uh, also has the UT, uh, Uniswap token, which can be used for governance. Uh, that's something that's upcoming. I think that's the uh, next version, V3, of uh, Uniswap. And then uh, people who are using the Uniswap ecosystem can then use these governance tokens to vote on certain uh, objects. <clears throat> um, a lot of companies also use a foundation structure. And this is something that we actually advise a lot of our clients. So of course, depending on the uh, objects of the objectives of the project, uh, you know, what kind of uh, project you're running and what you're trying to do, uh, certain structures will be better. So one of the common structures that we actually advise our clients to go for would be a uh, offshore foundation uh, because that will be uh, less stringent on cryptocurrency regulations. And then at the same time, they could also have, uh, they could institute a governance token as well. So what this means is if it's a foundation, then it's all the members that have the, the voting rights. Certain countries can have unlimited number of uh, shareholders or members. And these guys could uh, basically take a direction uh, of by voting on the the project uh, alternatively it could be a combination hybrid model between the voting rights accorded to the members or the uh, shareholders uh, as long as as well as the governance token holders or purely governance token holders right so all these are certain uh, patterns of governance that we can see in the market which is best really depends uh, of course it's more uh, unwieldy if you have you know thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who have tokens who want to give a voice it does give more community buy-in it goes towards the ideals of uh, decentralized finance and uh, decentralized exchanges and the whole concept of cryptocurrencies is basically uh, you know currency for the people so it does go towards uh, the original ideals and tenets of uh, the industry but at the same time it does not um, it is much more unwieldy. It's much more difficult to make um, quick decisions and to have quick changes in directions, right? So I leave you with this in terms of governance. And finally, on the future of DeFi, I think it still has a way to grow. Uh, what we saw in the in the boom of the ICOs phase was from basically 
uh, early 2017 until early 2018. And the tail end of it was basically mid 2018. So there was a one to one and a half year runway for ICOs. DeFi be started becoming popular around Q2 of uh, 2020. So if we are going by the same one and a half year timeline, um, I'm expecting at least the popularity of DeFi to extend until the end of the year, uh, beyond one and a half years. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, because of so much institutional money coming in, more and more innovation is coming in, more and more governments are open uh, to the idea of cryptocurrencies and more sovereign wealth funds, more governments are uh, receptive and compliant with uh, cryptocurrencies. And more regulations are coming up, so the regulators have less cause to be worried about cryptocurrencies because they have had the last three years to study this and they basically know what to do right now. So I think the future of DeFi is that it will still grow. Um, it still has a ways to go. The market cap right now at you know uh, 40 to 80 billion dollars total value locked in the ecosystem. Like uh, new, um, like uh, dot, right? Polka dot. <clears throat> That's one protocol. Second is exchanges. Uh, you can see Huopi, Coinbase, uh, and and uh, of course Binance, etc. And those with the no native tokens. This is a big use case for for cryptocurrencies as well. Native tokens for exchanges. And the third is, of course, finance. Uh, ultimately, cryptocurrencies are called currencies. Uh, and so that has a huge element of finance. And these are the three main use cases. So I think decentralized finance has still got a, a long way to go. Blockchain can be utilized in many, many industries. And that is going to happen at, over the next one to three decades. I think blockchain will permeate, uh, pervade a lot of uh, different industries. And you can see a lot of utilizations. But the first utilization is always money, right? So decentralized finance, uh, in my books, is probably going to keep uh, expanding. Um, there are so many of my our old clients and old associates who were doing projects back uh, three years ago, two years ago, and now they're back uh, doing DeFi projects or different DeFi variants of, uh, of of all of these projects. So I think that's the future of DeFi. Uh, it is going to have a hybrid model between DeFi and CeFi, centralized finance. Uh, some platforms will be hybrids, so they are called HiFi, H-Y-F-I. And I think hybrid models will probably win in the long run. Uh, you'll see a lot of traditional uh, centralized finance institutions like the, the you know, old banks and financial institutions coming to terms with the new decentralized finance models. And I think the successful winners in this space will be those that can combine centralized finance with all the regulations and licenses together with the new technolo technological advancements in, in finance uh, led by the charge of DeFi. So uh, I'll leave you with this. Um, and I'll speak with you at my next session. All right, cheers. <clears throat>